You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. And welcome to GHS TV's award-winning talk show, Crosstalk. I'm your host, Brandon Sewell. Each week, we discuss topics important to our diverse community. With the election day coming up on November 8th, it is important for citizens to go out and vote. Today, we'll be talking with people from different political positions to get a deeper insight and understanding of this year's election. Our first segment is about local politics and the impact redistricting is having on the races here and around the country. Joining me is David Matlock, political science professor at the University of Memphis. Thank you for coming on the show, Mr. Matlock. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So there is talk in both Republican and Democratic circles that the other party poses a threat to our democracy. Can you define what democracy means in our modern world? Sure. Uh, democracy simply means uh, uh, government by the people. Mm -hmm. Well, and government of the people, too. The problem we've had in America is this evolution of what the people means. Mm -hmm. So it's grown in time from being property owners to, to simply people who define themselves as white, to simply people who define themselves as African American, and then we add women into the mix. But, but we're constantly asking ourselves, right, mm -hmm. who are the people who can participate? So what do you think are some threats to our democracy here? Well, Commonly held threats, at least mm -hmm. with, within the, the, the college arena, I think mm -hmm. you would see is that uh, for democracy to work, uh, people and political parties have to know how to lose. Mm -hmm. And they also have to understand that even though they do lose, that somewhere down the road they have a chance of winning again. Historically what has occurred is when people don't feel they have a chance of winning mm -hmm. again, um, they resort to desperate measures. And what you've seen lately is very indicative of what's occurred all throughout America's history, desperate measures by people to try to hold on to power because they mm -hmm. don't think they can ever get power back again. Mm -hmm. Simply it. Well, where do you think America, like what are the steps we can take to reverse those de desperate measures happening? Well, we need to, to have the people who are saying and doing these things, mm -hmm. number one, to stop doing it and to believe in the system enough to know that especially in recent history, they will get power back mm -hmm. at, at some point. Um, politics has changed a lot since 1972, mm -hmm. and what you've seen is there has been this back and forth of people getting power. So what new voter laws are, were passed in Tennessee, and what do they mean for our voters? Well, voting, voting laws in Tennessee are pretty much indicative of what most southern states are doing, mm -hmm. which is they want to make sure right, that people have IDs. And I think in Tennessee you have to have a picture ID. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have a place of residence. And, of course, you have to vote at the right place at the right time. What is, what is happening in Tennessee and other states, especially in the south, is that people are being restricted in terms of when and where they can vote. Mm -hmm. And, again, it's another sign of desperation by one party to say that we're not really sure we have enough voters um, to, to keep our party winning. Mm -hmm. So after the 2020 election, lawmakers in mostly red states passed mm -hmm. new laws that they said would make this election more secure. Uh, can you like explain to our <laughs> viewers why these lawmakers felt they needed to pass these laws even though the 2020 election was the most secure to date? Yes. Well, the foundation of all this is uh, the Republican Party is not growing. Mm -hmm. And so when a party is not growing, you have to resort to other methods to make sure that, that you're winning. Because if you really look at the demographics of the party right now, mm -hmm. it's mostly white, male, rural, uh, evangelical Christian. Mm -hmm. And so unless they change their message, 
or unless they lose a lot till they just hit rock bottom, you're going to keep seeing all of these measures that they're doing in Tennessee, mm -hmm. Alabama, Georgia, uh, all of these states are doing the same thing, right? They're restricting people's access to the ballot who they don't want to vote. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the Republican Party will change their message in the future? I believe they'll change their message in the future, but only if they hit rock bottom and mm -hmm. they don't have anywhere else to go. Um, I mean, there, there are some points of optimism for the party and then mm -hmm. I think more and more people who define themselves as uh, Latino and, and Hispanic, uh, that has been a growing part of the party. But again, the problem is young people are not really flocking to that party mm -hmm. um, because they bought more into the, the diverse notion of the nation. So. Um, they're not going to be in a party that polarizes people. They actually want to be part of the majority of people. At least that's what the statistics are showing. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Madlock, one of the major changes this election cycle is the redistricting right. that happened after the 2020 census. Yes. Can you explain this process? Sure. Uh, with every census, mm -hmm. um, we, we try to make sure that there are a particular number of people who live in each district. Well, of course, people move, right? We have a very, very mobile society. Mm -hmm. And what happens with this mobility is some districts uh, end up losing voters, as in some states lose voters, some states gain voters, which means some districts gain voters. So you have to redraw the lines every 10 years, the party in power. Mm -hmm. uh, the, again, the, the problem with that is that if the party in power is redrawing district lines, they tend to do it to their advantage. And so there are two things you do. Right. You, you draw the lines to where your group um, owns that district, mm -hmm. or you redraw the lines to where you dilute the other uh, party's power in that district. And, and so those things have tended to work since the last presidential election. What effect does redistricting have on our political climate? Well, it, it, it forces us, especially at the legal level, to mm -hmm. figure out right, what is a proper voting district. So if someone redraws the line that says, I want this district, just using as an example, that used to be formerly um, mostly African American, now to be practically all white, mm -hmm. right? Well then that gets into legal issues and, and, and the party that wants that doesn't mind taking those things to court. You've seen it right now in Alabama. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's a perfect example of what's going on. So gerrymandering has become a huge issue in our country. Yes. Uh, can you explain some of the implications gerrymandering has on voter turnout? Well, it, 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 in many ways it discourages voter turnout if you, if you automatically know that no matter how you vote, mm -hmm. your vote is going to be diluted and diminished. Um, and again, most of the time gerrymandering occurs along, for lack of better terms, racial lines. Mm -hmm. um, it, they try to disguise it as being socioeconomic lines, but for the most part, it's along racial lines. Well, Mr. Matlock, this was such an informative discussion. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. We have to take a break. When we return, we'll find out how the two local parties in Shelby County are getting out the vote this November. Camera one, switch audio, cue talent. So GHSCV was started in 1982 by Frank Bluestein, the department's founder. It's a multi-million dollar television studio and students who are a part of it have the opportunity to do real world work. Welcome to GHS Insider, the show. That what makes this program unique is the students here. We come with a lot of potential and a lot of talent. And we also come with the mindset of we have to do this. We can do this. In this class, we really have the ability to be as creative as we want to be. On the show today, we take you to the side. When you see yourself on a screen, it's a feeling where it's like I actually contributed to something. I actually did something that matters to people. We have fun days, like when we do shows and we do a really good show, it's that adrenaline of like, oh wow, we just did a really good show, we did it. Hey everyone, I'm Brooklyn White. And there's a real sense of pride that comes from completing a show that you have written, produced, thought of on your own. And that sense of pride is really important and it keeps us motivated because we want to do more. We want to experience that feeling again. We're always pushing the kids. We're always challenging them and they rise to the, to the challenge. So the program has absolutely changed a lot for me. It has given me a view into the arts and has 
let me see that I really do enjoy working behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. The future of our program really a lot of times is up to the students. It's their willingness to see beyond what is here and what it can be. Year to year, it changes with the students, but the ability of the students never changes. Go Red Devils! For more information about the Kappa program, visit ghskappa.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Crosstalk. There are two sides to every political issue, and today we have the opportunity to listen to both. Gabriela Salinas, chair of the Shelby County Democratic Party, and Luke Symbol, chair of Young Republicans of Shelby County, Join me now to talk about how they are reaching out to voters to affect change at the local level. Thank you for allowing me to interview Mr. Symbol and Ms. Salinas. Thank you for having us. So we're just a few weeks out from the 2020 election. Ms. Salinas, what issues are most important to voters that you've been talking to here in Shelby County? Yeah, there's a lot of issues that are important. Freedom of speech and the banning mm -hmm. of books and happening in school gun violence that's very important um, especially here in Shelby County in the last month that we have had mm -hmm. it's been a, a hard month uh, education health care mm -hmm. those are very important to voters here in Shelby County and Mr. Stimble what issues are most important to the voters that you've been talking to I think the the most important issue that we are seeing right now and everybody is talking about it is the rise in violent crime mm -hmm. in Memphis Voters are very concerned about liberal uh, district attorneys around the country that are focusing so much on prioritizing the criminal mm -hmm. versus prioritizing the safety of citizens at home who are not committing crimes. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of high profile events here in Shelby County, unfortunately, the last several weeks, and crime is on everybody's minds. Yes. So, Mr. Symbol, how does your party appeal to young voters who don't usually vote? What we do is we address the issues head on. I always like to say, mm -hmm. if you want young people to get involved in the Republican Party, let's talk about the issues and define them so that they understand that the Republicans are the ones who win on the issues every time. Mm -hmm. We can talk about violent crime. We see Democratic-run cities across the country spikes in violent crime because we have liberal DAs mm -hmm. who are letting criminals out of jail. Um, we're talking about cashless bail, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about lenient um, policies that are letting criminals out early, thank God for truth and sentencing that Tennessee recently passed. Um, you know, we're seeing it on the local school board level. Uh, young people are getting involved when they see that public schools used to send people to the moon 50 years ago, and now students are confused about the bathroom they're supposed to use. Mm -hmm. I think um, Republicans win on the issues, and that's how we're getting young people uh, fired up to, to go out and vote and get involved and volunteer on campaigns. Well, what about the Democratic Party, Ms. Salinas? What is your party? Yeah, doing? it starts with our, our structure of our party, right? Mm -hmm. We have the high school Democrats, we have the college Democrats, mm -hmm. we have the young Democrats that are involved at all levels of government here in, our, in, in Shelby County and in our state. Um, we have a national board member in uh, Chattanooga, and he's mm -hmm. working to get high schoolers on the executive committee. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, not only are we asking you to volunteer and help us get our candidates elected because the issues are so important to young people, but we want people and young people to have a position of leadership where they can direct mm -hmm. how our party's moving, what we're tackling, what our agenda looks like, who we're recruiting to run for office. Um, and you can see by the people that we have gotten elected, Michael and Easter Thomas, mm -hmm. the young millennial in uh, city council. You look at Michael Whaley in the county commission, a young person. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that's how we're prioritizing and letting our young people set the agenda. If you look at who has led change in our country, look at Ruby Bridges and desegregating school. It was mm -hmm. a young kindergartner. Look at Malala Yousaf and the uh, amount of advocacy she has done for education. Look at Greta Thunberg and the stuff that she has done on the environment. So when we have young people at the table, things change. So that's what we're doing in Shelby County, yeah, Democrats. So many people don't realize that it's the local and state races that have much more of an impact on the national races. Uh, why is that, Mr. Symbol? 
Well, I, the good news is I think that's starting to change. So mm -hmm. first I'll just say we're seeing around the country um, people getting uh, really involved in local races like school board races. Mm -hmm. I think COVID opened a lot of people's eyes to how important local elections are. When they saw that bars and restaurants could be open, but that churches had to be closed around the country, they said, wait a minute, who's making those decisions? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we want to be a part of that too. Um, structurally, I think over time, the media has really focused on these national issues. And as people watch television, you know, they're watching cable news. Um, it's national issues all the time. Um, I think that's why we saw a shift towards focusing on national issues, uh, less focus on local elections. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm confident that we've seen in the past couple of years, a lot more people are focusing on local elections, and that's exciting. So in order to enact change, you have to win the election. So Ms. Salinas, how does your party recruit strong candidates to re represent the party? Yeah, so we look for leadership in our community, right? Mm -hmm. Like, look at Charlie Caswell and the stuff that he's doing in Fraser. Um, so who are the people that are in their communities, that are in their neighborhoods making change um, happen and advocating for their communities? Uh, and then we ask them, hey, do, would you ever want to run for office? Mm -hmm. um, what do we need to do to make you feel prepared um, and see that this is worth your time, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that the budget is has uh, prioritized in the way that you think benefits your community. Making sure that we have safe schools and we have, uh, that we're not banning books, that make all of those decisions are made at the local level, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's your state house people, your, your state senators, your committee people, your school boards, all of those people. So we're looking for people who who is in charge of the PTA, mm -hmm. right? And can we reach out to them to run for school board? We have a PTA candidate uh, that's running in Bartlett. So those are the people that we try to get engaged in the political process. Can I follow up on that? Yes. Um, similar to the Democratic Party, we have a system of high school Republicans, young Republicans, all the way on up. And what, mm -hmm. what the Republican Party here locally is doing really well is that they are letting young Republicans run local campaigns. Mm -hmm. uh, Brent Taylor, who's running for state senate in District 31, his campaign is run by a young Republican, and his interns and volunteers are all at the college age to young Republican level. That's really exciting. Uh, we're seeing that the Tennessee House Caucus, their West Tennessee field rep, who's, who's helping out on all of these races uh, for the state rep positions in West Tennessee, he's a young Republican. The Republican Party is so great about getting people involved early. What it does is, it, it number one, it's great networking. It trains people how to run mm -hmm. so that once they're, they feel comfortable and they're ready, we have them running for, for local positions and statewide positions. Well, Mr. Symbol and Ms. Salinas, thank you both for informing us more about your representative parties. Thank you so much for having thank us. You. For more information on both of these organizations, you can visit their websites, shelbyglp.org and shelbydem.org. After the break, we can talk to a member of the Tennessee Senate to see what she has to say about today's political landscape. Forty-five years ago, the Poplar Pike Playhouse came into existence under the direction of Frank Bluestein. And over the years, his reputation and the reputation of the program grew, and so students from the community um, just clamored to be a part of this program. God bless us, everyone! A student comes into Germantown High School that's interested in theater, they're going to start an introduction to theater. You get a great overview of what theater is. And then, if you want to continue in our program, then you have a choice of taking two other classes. You can take either acting or tech theater. That is very hands-on, and the students will learn a lot about set building, uh, lighting design, sound design. Something that's very unique about PPP is that the students do everything here. We do the lights, we do the set, we do the acting, we do the dancing. We do Everything you see backstage and on stage, a student is doing it. It is completely student ran. Tonight I got a the Popper Pie Playhouse has definitely still grown my love for theater. We want to do great work, um, and we really, really uh, want this to be an experience for students that they will hold on to for the rest of their lives, and that they will take the things that they learned 
into their lives um, and help shape them into uh, really productive citizens. Everybody, 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 everybody cut loose! For more information about the Kappa program, visit ghskappa.com or call 755-7775. You're watching the award-winning GHS-TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Brandon Sewell. Tennessee State Senator Ramesh Akberry has represented District 29 in Nashville since 2018. Before that, she was the State House Representative for District 91. She has been an outspoken supporter of criminal justice reform, economic development in underserved communities, health care expansion, and public education investment. State Senator Ack Berry joins us virtually from Washington, D.C. Thank you for coming on the show, Ms. Ack Berry. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to our discussion. So I want to first talk about the political climate that America is in right now. What are your top concerns? Uh, my top concerns really is uh, kind of this uh, attack on our democracy, mm -hmm. where you have elected officials who are unwilling to compromise for great policy. They put politics over people. Mm -hmm. I think what we saw on January the 6th is something that most of us could not have imagined happening in America. Right. So I think we've got to get back to having conversations with each other. Our civil discourse has to improve, otherwise our democracy will continue to suffer. Do you have any concerns at the state level? On a state level, I think the same thing. I mean, honestly, uh, they used to say in, in the General Assembly, we're not like those people in Washington. We can actually talk to each other. And I worry that as people get more and more partisan, they go to their own corners, whether mm -hmm. the extreme left or the extreme right, uh, we're not having conversations. And when we don't talk about our issues, we have so much that we have in common and we can work towards better solutions. So my concern, I am concerned about that, about hyper-partisanship. So let's dive into the last legislative session. So there were a lot of education-related bills that were passed. Which ones did you support and which do you oppose? Well, uh, I was one of the few Democrats that supported a new funding for our school system mm -hmm. that would have put an additional $100 million into Memphis and Shelby County schools, which is really important to me. Um, I think that literacy is one of our number one issues that we have addressed statewide. Kids are not reading on a grade level. And after third grade, you should be, you know, reading to learn, not still learning to read. Mm -hmm. um, some things that I did not support, of course, had to do with some of these slate of hate bills attacking trans students, LGBTQ students. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, every child, no matter who they identify as or, or anything else, should be able to learn in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of what, what I didn't really agree with. Um, there were some conversations around athletes that were kneeling on a collegiate level. Mm -hmm. I think that that was too far of an intrusion into their individual rights of expression as well. Well, which bill do you think will have the most impact for Shelby County? Well, I think the school funding formula bill will have the most impact this year mm -hmm. uh, because it will put those in additional funds into our, our budget. However, uh, specifically for Germantown schools is the 3G bill, yes. which I was firmly against because I think that Germantown had an opportunity to educate students at Germantown High School and the other mm -hmm. two schools, and they chose not to. They gave that right to Memphis Shelby County Schools and you as a student and parents and teachers deserve stability and to know that there's not going to be this jockeying between school districts mm -hmm. over a school. You should be able to start in ninth grade and know that you're going to finish there in your 12th grade year. So speaking of the 3G bill, what do you think is the future going forward for the 3G schools? Well, I think there are three options. Um, the way the law is written, uh, there has to be some sort of agreement between Germantown mm -hmm. and Memphis Shelby County Schools so that they can continue to operate. However, there is an existing agreement that was put in place by a federal court eight years ago mm -hmm. uh, that, that you know directly conflicts with the new law. So I could see there being a lawsuit there, or I could see it, a long-term lease where Memphis Shelby County Schools leases those buildings from Germantown if they agree to turn them over. And then, of course, the possibility of having to build a school, a school altogether and fund a major issue for that. Mm -hmm. So I know from my research that you were opposed to the school voucher law. 
Uh, what were your concerns? Well, I think, quite frankly, uh, with the voucher bill, uh, it was not complete enough, right? Mm -hmm. So you were not providing transportation to the kids that would take advantage of the voucher. You're not providing additional funding for, you know, social programs, for books, for anything like that. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen any evidence that these private schools, children are performing at a higher level on state tests mm -hmm. than our uh, traditional public school students. And it, it really shifts resources away. So mm -hmm. I, I think that if we want to improve public schools, we have to invest more in our public schools. That really is a solution. And if we look at other states that have adopted these vouchers, like Florida or Wisconsin mm -hmm. or Arizona, the students have not achieved more. If they were achieving more, I would be in support of it. But I can't support something that I know is not going to really help our students. Mm -hmm. So as far as mm -hmm. that voucher law, do you think it should be improved upon or do you think it should be scrapped? Well, I think as it's written, it should be scrapped because it's written only to apply to Nashville and Memphis, which mm -hmm. really on its face is unconstitutional. So there's ongoing litigation around that. But uh, it definitely, first of all, if you're talking about something, it should have statewide implication. It should have built-in guardrails for if a child is actually improving or not, because we're talking about public taxpayer dollars that are going to a private entity. Right. And whether you're talking about education or business, you want to see that there is a return on, on that investment of public dollars. So would you say that Tennessee is going in the right educational direction? I think Tennessee is trying, right? Mm -hmm. So the funding formula to add additional funds based on a, a student's individual needs, whether they are in a concentration area of high concentration of poverty, a rural district, English is their second language, any of those mm -hmm. factors increases the amount of funding per student. I think that's important. I do think that we have to be a little bit more deliberate about how we are paying and recruiting and retaining our teachers. Mm -hmm. And we also have to really think not along more, continue to think more along the lines of not just the traditional four year college, mm -hmm. but making sure that folks, that young people have an opportunity to go into a technical career or right into a job when they graduate because the job market demands it. Mm -hmm. We have to look you know, 20 years down the line, what are we preparing kids to be uh, as an adult? Or are we still kind of, you know, in the stone ages in that regard? So looking ahead, are there any bills you're looking forward to getting passed? Certainly. I mean, education or otherwise, I really mm -hmm. would like to look at school discipline. When we look at some of the crime issues in Memphis and across the state, a lot of those people were juvenile offenders. So mm -hmm. what happened when they were arrested as a child? What sort of rehabilitation were they given? What sort of resources? How were they shown an alternative to, to kind of maybe what they saw in their neighborhood? So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about, again, like I said, looking at the use of exclusionary discipline. I don't believe that kindergartners and first graders should be suspended mm -hmm. um, I, because if they behave poorly, I don't even know if they know what that means unless they're endangering someone. And then, right. of course, continuing to address literacy. Uh, that I mean, that's just the number one key. That is a ticket for most people in education. If you cannot read, you cannot learn. And that to me is something I'm looking to continue to address. Mm -hmm. Well, Ms. Mm -hmm. Ackberry, thank you for joining us virtually from D.C. I enjoyed talking with you. I did as well. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to talking to you soon. I want to thank all our guests for being on the show today. And I want to remind all of our viewers to go out and vote. Early voting starts October 19th, and you can vote on Election Day, which is November 8th. For more information on our programming, please check us out on the web at ghstv.org where we are streaming live 24 hours a day. You can also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Brandon Sewell. From all of us here at GHS-TV, thank you for watching Crosstalk, and I hope to see you again.